Late one August evening in 1864, Abraham Lincoln was riding from the White House to the soldier's home, where he and Mary were spending their third summer. Lincoln was still convinced he was going to be defeated in the presidential election, now just weeks away. Someone had fired a shot, Lincoln told his wife, but it must have been an accident. Maybe some hunter emptying his gun before going home. Mary Lincoln was terrified. Mr. Lincoln's life is always exposed. No one knows what it is to live in constant dread of some fearful tragedy. The president has been warned so often that I tremble for him. I have a presentiment that he will meet with a sudden and violent end. In spite of the war, the presidential campaign of 1864 went ahead with all the usual excitement. It's a full-blown American political campaign, complete with barbecues, fireworks, parades. It looked almost like the nation hadn't fallen apart. With the survival of the nation still in the balance, Lincoln's faith in democracy remained unshaken. It's the people's business. The election is in their hands. If they turn their backs to the fire and get scorched in the rear, they'll find they've got to sit on the blisters. Lincoln believed that the people would vote against him unless his army began to win clear-cut victories. Then on September 2nd, 1864, he got a message from William Tecumseh Sherman. It would turn the election around. Atlanta is ours and fairly won, it said. Everybody sees the fall of Atlanta as signaling that the Confederacy is dying. People can see that the war is winding down. And if they will simply stay the course a little bit longer, that victory will be had. Election day, November 8th. That evening, while Mary Lincoln waited nervously inside the White House, Lincoln and his secretary splashed across to the War Department to follow the returns. The first results gave Lincoln Philadelphia and Baltimore. Lincoln asked that the encouraging news be sent over to Mrs. Lincoln. She, he said, is more anxious than I. As more and more good news rattled in, Lincoln and a few friends settled into a quiet celebratory supper. The president, his secretary remembered, went awkwardly and hospitably to work, shoveling out the fried oysters. Lincoln carried every state but three and won a popular majority of nearly half a million votes. Four years earlier, Lincoln had been little known and often laughed at. Now, with a clear mandate to fight on to victory, he resolved to fight another battle as well. 
The Emancipation Proclamation had freed only those slaves living in rebel territory. Lincoln wanted an amendment to the Constitution banning slavery forever from every part of the United States. If Negroes stake their lives for us, they must be prompted by the strongest motive, even the promise of freedom. There have been men who proposed to me to return to slavery the black warriors of Port Hudson. I should be damned in time and eternity for so doing. The world shall know that I will keep my faith to friends and enemies, come what will. Lincoln was determined that Congress pass the amendment before Inauguration Day as a symbol of national unity. He was certain of victory in the Senate, but first he needed a two-thirds majority in the House of Representatives. Lincoln put all the powers of his office and of his recent re-election behind this amendment. He called congressmen into the White House, and then he began on twisting. Probably promising some kind of federal patronage position, postmastership, customs office. Basically what he did was to work the congressmen one by one by one until he got enough of a majority and then he persuaded even some Democrats to say, look, this is going to be done next year, if not this, let's get on with it. <laughs> Three votes, the two-thirds majority is achieved. And the House chamber just breaks into a wild celebration. The congressman got up and cheered. The galleries cheered, with, by the way, blacks in the congressional galleries for the first time. It was one of the greatest occasions in the history of Congress. And the House, uh, in, in honor of what they called this great historic occasion, voted to take the rest of the day off. The 13th Amendment pronounced a death sentence for slavery. Ratification by three quarters of the states seemed assured. The president was so pleased, he insisted on signing the resolution even though his signature was not legally required. The great job is ended. I congratulate myself, the country, and the whole world upon this great moral victory. For all of the hedging that he did about the Emancipation Proclamation, about black troops, it's ultimately Lincoln's skill and Lincoln's commitment that leads to the 13th Amendment. That night, a White House servant remembered, the president slept as he had not slept in months. With the fall of Atlanta, the nature of the war changed. Sherman began burning homes and destroying crops as he marched through Georgia toward Savannah and the sea. It became a very different kind of war. War against civilians and not just soldiers. War waged on southern farms, take from them what they have and feed your own troops with it. But what you can't take, burn and destroy. Lincoln comes to the view that this is the only way the South can be conquered. And he saw very clearly that we can't conquer the minds of these people. And the only thing we can do is make war so terrible that, that they'll eventually give up. While Sherman cut a path through Georgia, General Philip Sheridan stormed through Virginia's fertile Shenandoah Valley, plundering farms, torching barns, tearing up rail lines, 
At the same time, northern troops began to come upon Union prisoners of war, many in desperate condition because the rebels had run out of food to feed them. Lincoln himself carried a photograph of one of them, ready to show it to anyone who objected to the harsh treatment his commanders were now meeting out to the South. As the suffering continued, Lincoln read and reread the tragedies of Shakespeare and turned to the Bible. He had a Bible on his desk at all times. He knew it almost by heart. And during these terrible months, he read the Bible more carefully, more frequently than ever. On one occasion, Elizabeth Keckley saw him reading the Bible. And she found an excuse to go behind the sofa and to see what he was reading. And he was reading Job. Inauguration Day, March 4th, 1865. All the bloodshed, all the agony. Lincoln turned them over and over in his mind. At Gettysburg, he had given the fighting a higher purpose. Now, in his second inaugural address, he would try to find an explanation for the last four years of pain and suffering. Lincoln's second inaugural address was personally meaningful for him because it matters to him to explain things. It matters to find the right words. But it also mattered for the country. This is why we had a war. As Lincoln began to speak, the sun broke through the clouds. Four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. And the war came. Victory seemed close now, and he might have been expected to exult. Instead, he questioned. Both sides read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any man should dare ask a just God's assistance and wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Lincoln felt that God had given both the North and South this bloody retribution for the sins of the nation. The sin of the nation was 250 years of enslavement of African Americans, and God was punishing them for this. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue, until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with a lash shall be paid by another drawn with a sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. It is the Old Testament of a just and righteous God who wreaks on his enemies what they deserve. And this, in some sense, Lincoln found very consoling. If this is what God wills, it is not just what I, Abraham Lincoln, will. I am carrying out his wishes in seeing that this war is prosecuted to a very bitter end. 
He always got the sense with Lincoln that he was wrestling with his own guilt, that he was wrestling with death. The death, the destruction, the apocalyptic nature of this war is incomprehensible. He has to turn this over to God. When God wills that it ends, it will end, and not till then. The second inaugural address is a spiritual thing, but it is also a call for unity. We are almost there. We are almost there. You know, God has brought us this far. Stay the course, and when we're done, let's let us not exact recriminations on one another. The Union remained sacred to Lincoln. He wanted once again to make it whole, to bring the South back. But he knew it would not be easy. Four years of bloody war had left many Northerners raw with anger, bitter and vengeful. Even his own wife spoke privately of revenge. Mary Lincoln could not forgive the South for starting a war that had fractured the Union turned her own brothers into her enemies and threatened to overwhelm her husband. Mary wants to somehow make up for all that she has lost, and the only way to do that is to punish the South. She can't see what Lincoln has come to. She's taken a different path during the war than he has, and they both come out, sadly, in very different places. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. As Lincoln finished his speech, he looked out over the enormous crowd. Standing alongside whites were African Americans who had by now come to see the president as something like a savior. Lincoln must have been touched uh, as he looked out to see the large number of blacks watching, listening, honoring him. Those were his constituents, you see, uh, just as others were there as his constituents. And I, I, I think that by this time, having gone through what he went through, I'm not certain at all that he was making a, a, a great distinction between <laughs> this group of constituents and the other. That evening, at the inaugural reception, police tried to bar the way of a black man who insisted on being admitted. Lincoln told them to let the man pass. Frederick Douglass was the first African American ever to attend an inaugural reception, and the president greeted him warmly. What had he thought of the speech? Mr. Lincoln Douglass replied, that was a sacred effort. On March 23rd, the Lincolns boarded the River Queen at Washington and set out for Grant's headquarters at City Point, Virginia, just 20 miles from the Confederate capital. The president was worn out, but he wanted to visit the army that now seemed so close to victory. Mary insisted on going too. She needed to be near him. She lived in fear, she wrote a friend, that the deep waters through which we have passed will overwhelm me. Three days later, Mary and Mrs. Grant were scheduled to join their husbands at a grand review of the Union Army. As their carriage bumped slowly along deeply rutted roads, jolting the two women, Mary grew more and more agitated. <laughs> 
her pent-up anxieties and closely guarded fears were about to explode for all the world to see. By the time Mary reached the parade ground, her husband was already riding down the line of troops. Mrs. Edward Ord, the commanding general's wife, was at his side, in Mary's place. Mary erupted in fury, loudly accusing the innocent woman of flirting with her husband. Mrs. Ord burst into tears. There was not the slightest hint that the president was flirting with Mrs. Ord. It is true, however, that Mary worried about flirtations, even when they didn't exist. Mary was an incorrigible flirt, and I think she projected her own tendencies, which were just to make her feel better, make her feel younger, perfectly innocent. But she projected those fantasies in dead seriousness onto other women. Then Mary shouted at the president himself, demanding that he remove the woman's husband from his command. Mrs. Grant tried to restrain her, but Mary was out of control. It was the first really open public display of their differences that they had ever permitted themselves since he became president. At dinner on board the steamer that evening, Mary resumed her tirade. Embarrassed guests tried not to look. Lincoln bore it, one remembered, as Christ might have done. With an expression of pain and sadness that cut one to the heart, but with supreme calmness and dignity. He called her mother with his old time plainness till she turned on him like a tigress. And then he walked away, hiding that noble, ugly face that we might not catch the full expression of his misery. The Lincoln stayed on at City Point while the president conferred with his commanders. He ordered Grant and Sherman not to let the rebels get away this time, but he also urged them to offer the most generous terms of surrender. Let them all go, officers and all. I want submission and no more bloodshed. I want no one punished. We want those people to return to their allegiance to the Union. After her humiliating outburst, Mary Lincoln did not leave her cabin for three days. The president explained she wasn't feeling well. Then he sent her home to Washington. She later claimed her husband had had a dream that the White House had burned down and had asked her to go and see if it were true. Lincoln remained behind. He did not want to miss the all-out attack on Petersburg that was about to begin. He hoped it would be the final battle of the war. On April 2nd at 4.20 in the morning, while Lincoln watched and listened from City Point, Grant hurled his army against the Confederate trenches. The rebel lines broke. Among the dead left behind were boys as young as 14. Richmond now lay undefended, and Union troops marched into the city. Lee headed west with what was left of his army, but this time the Federals were right behind him. The next day, Lincoln was in high spirits as he and his son, Tad, headed up the James River to Richmond. He could not resist having a look at what had once been the capital of the Confederacy. It's a kind of a funny expedition. They start on a real ship, and then it has to be diverted. So then they, they put him on a tugboat, and that pulls him a little bit further, and something happens to it. And so they put him in a little rowboat and row him into Richmond. He tells a friend that I'm reminded of a story from my patronage days of the man who came to me and said, 
I want to be Secretary of State. And I said, I'm sorry, that job's already taken. Well, he said, you could make me ambassador to England. No, that job's already taken. Well, he said, you could make me consul to France. No, that job's already taken. Well, said the man, you could at least give me a pair of old used trousers. It pays to be humble, said Lincoln in his rowboat as he arrives uh, in, in Richmond. Much of the Confederate capital lay in ruins, destroyed by retreating rebels and looted by hungry mobs. As Lincoln made his way through the smoky streets, hundreds of former slaves surrounded him. Some knelt at his feet. Lincoln was embarrassed. Don't kneel to me, he said. You must kneel to God only and thank him for your liberty. While Tad waited outside, Lincoln entered the abandoned official residence of Jefferson Davis. For a time, he sits in Jefferson Davis's chair, and he sees finally total victory within his command. This was the triumphal scene of his life. Five days later, on the evening of April 9th, his Secretary of War brought him the telegram he had been waiting for. General Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia this morning, it read. Four years of civil war had ended. around the house have been immense. In the midst of the bands playing, I break forth into singing. If the close of that terrible war has left some of our hearthstones very, very desolate, God has been, as ever, kind and merciful in the midst of our heavy afflictions. It's a day of tremendous rejoicing. There are bonfires, there are fireworks, there are rallies, there are songs, and people crowd up to the White House and they want to congratulate the president. A mighty cheer went up when Lincoln appeared. Surprising everyone, he called upon the Marine Band to play the unofficial anthem of the Confederacy. While Tad frantically waved a captured rebel flag from an upstairs window. I've always thought Dixie one of the best tunes I've ever heard. Our adversaries over the way attempted to appropriate it. I presented the question to the Attorney General, and he gave it as his legal opinion that it is our lawful pride. The next evening, a happy crowd gathered on the White House grounds. With Mary watching from a nearby window, Lincoln stepped forward to speak. Illuminated by a single flickering candle, his face was pale, Elizabeth Keckley recalled, but his soul was flashing through his eyes. As Tad knelt out of sight at his father's feet to catch each page of the speech, Lincoln began to read. Reuniting our country is fraught with great difficulty. Unlike the case of a war between independent nations, there is no authorized organ for us to treat with. No one man has authority to give up the rebellion for any other man. And we, the loyal people, differ among ourselves as to the mode, manner, and means of reconstruction. It's not what the crowd wanted. They wanted a celebration of how great we are, what wonderful things have happened, uh, how everything is going to be happy from now on out. 
Instead, Lincoln gives them a carefully reasoned uh, speech about reconstruction, of how we're going to rebuild this union. With the North deeply divided as to how to reunite the country and how the former slaves were to be treated, Lincoln wanted to steer a cautious course. He practices the art of the possible, just as he had moved step by step on emancipation. And that's what he was doing, I think, on Reconstruction and on the question that became central to Reconstruction, what was then called Negro suffrage. Lincoln told the crowd that he favored giving the vote to some freedmen. The very intelligent, he said, and those who serve our cause as soldiers. No other president had ever dared suggest that any African Americans be allowed to vote. He thought that blacks would become a kind of comfortable farming class in the South that could get along in a reconstructed Southern society. Their future would depend on themselves and their own exertions. And you have to remember that he thought, after all, I'm Abraham Lincoln, have been a self-made man. These blacks can become self-made men too. Listening in the crowd that evening was a young Confederate sympathizer who believed fervently that America was formed for the white, not for the black man. Lincoln's talking nigger citizenship, he muttered to a companion. That is the last speech he will ever make. John Wilkes Booth was a well-known actor. Lincoln had admired his performance in Shakespeare's Richard III and once said he would like to meet him. Two nights later, Lincoln had a dream. He seemed, he said later, to be in some singular, indescribable vessel, moving with great rapidity towards an indefinite shore. It was a familiar dream. He had had it before the great victories at Antietam and Gettysburg. Always, he said, it meant good news. The next afternoon, April 14th, was Good Friday, and Mary and Abraham Lincoln went for a carriage ride. The war was over. At last, the weary couple could relax and rejoice. They sat and talked about the future, and Lincoln said, between the loss of our darling Willie and the war, we have both been very miserable. We have to be more cheerful. And all the misery was going to go away and they would be happy again. Dear husband, Mary told him, you almost startled me by your great cheerfulness. She felt wonderful after this carriage ride. And that happiness, that pleasure that all the horror was over was with them the night they went to the theater. That evening, the Lincolns attended Ford's Theater with a young major named Henry Rathbone and his fiancee, Clara Harris. The play was a knockabout farce called Our American Cousin. The president seemed to enjoy it. Mary nestled against her husband. What will Miss Harris think of my hanging on to you so? She won't think anything about it. 
As Lincoln fell forward, Mary screamed. John Wilkes Booth had shot the President of the United States. The unconscious president was carried across 10th Street into a rooming house. Mary sat by his bedside, imploring him to answer her, to take her with him, not to leave her alone. At 7.22 on the morning of April 15, 1865, Abraham Lincoln died. Others would now have to try to bind up the nation's wounds. Lincoln's body rested in the East Room, where the Lincolns had so often received their guests. Mary remained upstairs in her bedroom, unable to see anyone, unable to attend her husband's funeral, inconsolable. Elizabeth Keckley stayed with her, listening helplessly to what she called the unearthly shrieks, the terrible convulsions. She was in a daze. She couldn't even speak. She couldn't even communicate. There was no getting close to her grief. Tad tried to comfort his mother, too, but her loud weeping frightened him. Don't cry so, Mama, he begged her. Don't cry, or you will make me cry. You will break my heart. On Wednesday, April 19th, Lincoln's coffin was carried from the White House to the Capitol, past government buildings draped in black. Lincoln lay in state all night and all the following day as long lines of citizens shuffled slowly by. I don't think there's ever been such an outpouring of emotion in American history. Lincoln is shot within days after Lee's surrender. Victory is had, and the man who represents everything that that victory symbolizes is struck down. On April 21st, Lincoln's final journey began. The morning went on for 16 more days as his coffin was slowly borne home to Springfield along the same tracks that had carried him to Washington. Huge grieving crowds received the cortege in cities all across the country. One senses that the country understands that when he dies, their anchor has been taken away. And they realize that something very special has passed out of their lives. And their reaction is extraordinary. So intensely felt, so deeply expressed. He was just a simple man with simple parents, and he made it all the way to the President of the United States. He freed three and a half million people who had been born into permanent bondage. He had an abundance of patience, an iron strength and will and a tenacity was the great hero who saved the Union. A Brooklyn poet named Walt Whitman, who had often paused to watch as the president passed along the streets of Washington, captured the people's sorrow and his own. When lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed and the great star early drooped in the western sky in the night, I mourned 
and yet shall mourn with ever returning spring. Here, coffin that slowly passes, I give you my sprig of lilac. On May 3rd, the funeral train arrived in Springfield. The next day at Oak Ridge Cemetery on the outskirts of town, Abraham Lincoln was laid to rest at last, alongside his sons, Eddie and Willie. Mary Lincoln did not accompany her husband's funeral train to Springfield. She was unable to leave her room. For over a month, she remained there. Then, heavily veiled and dressed in black, she left the White House for the last time. It was so unlike the day when the body of the president was born from the hall in grand and solemn state, Elizabeth Keckley remembered. Now the wife of the president was leaving the White House and there was scarcely a friend to tell her goodbye. The silence was almost painful. That same day, the mighty Union Army marched up Pennsylvania Avenue in celebration of its victory. While Mary Lincoln with her sons Robert and Tad boarded a train and headed for Illinois. Unable to face the memories that would have surrounded her in Springfield, she remained secluded in a Chicago hotel and gave herself over to grief. Day by day, I miss my beloved husband more and more. How I am to pass through life without him, who loved us so dearly, it is impossible for me to say. I must patiently await the hour when God's love shall place me by his side again. For I have almost become blind with weeping. Her grief became her chief preoccupation. She reminded herself of it constantly. She would not let herself forget it. She would not let her friends forget it. She couldn't believe what had happened to her because you must understand that not only did she lose the man she truly loved, her great partner in life, but the man who had made her the first lady of the land, the man who gave her status, the man who gave her importance and identity. As Mary mourned, the life of the man she had loved was already becoming the stuff of myth and legend. No American president had ever been assassinated. And in a country in which 600,000 men had died in just four years, the death of this one man became transcendent. Lincoln was soon memorialized as a hero as great as George Washington himself. Mary had to have basked in his reflected glory. And it had to have been part of what helped sustain her. But her life after his death is an unremitting series of, of pain and suffering and tragedy. For six years, Tad Lincoln was his mother's constant companion and only source of comfort, as Mary moved restlessly from rented room to rented room. Then, in 1871, Tad contracted tuberculosis and died. He was only 18. 
Mary's fragile grip on reality finally slipped away. She began to wander hotel corridors in her nightgown, was certain someone was trying to poison her, complained that an Indian spirit was removing wires from her eyes, and continued her frantic spending, purchasing yard after yard of elegant drapery when she had no windows in which to hang it. Then, on the evening of March 12, 1875, Mary Lincoln hurried into a Western Union office in Florida and sent a telegram to her only remaining son, Robert. My dearly beloved son, Robert T. Lincoln, rouse yourself and live for my sake. All I have is yours from this hour. I am praying every moment for your life to be spared to your mother. Carrying thousands of dollars in securities sewn into her dress, Mary hurried to Chicago to be at her son's side. She was convinced that he was dying. But Robert was perfectly well. He was sadly accustomed to his mother's irrational behavior, but now he was convinced that she had lost her mind and went to court to have her committed. Mary was given no chance to prepare a defense. It took just three hours for the jury to find her insane. The question one asks about Mary is, was she crazy? Was she a schizophrenic? You don't just develop schizophrenia in late middle age around the death of a child but you can hallucinate and be psychotic without being schizophrenic. Her life was an unending series of losses and at a certain point, she broke. Mary found the verdict so painful, she tried to kill herself by swallowing poison. She was committed to Bellevue Place, a private sanitarium for disturbed but well-to-do women in Batavia, Illinois, where she was a model patient. After three months, she was released. She was well treated, she was listened to, and she could calm herself sufficiently to return to being fragile and troubled, but not being psychotic. But she turned on her son, Robert, the man who had committed her. She felt indignant and infuriated. She just couldn't understand why he would do this to her. And she never really forgave him. Mary Lincoln had lost everyone she ever really cared about. Eddie. Willie, her husband, Tad, all taken from her. And Robert, her last surviving son, she now rode out of her life. Mary Lincoln lived for six more years, wandering aimlessly from city to city. In 1882, tired and ill, she returned to her sister's home in Springfield and was given her old bedroom above the parlor in which she had married Abraham Lincoln 40 years before. She was 64, nearly blind now, and partially paralyzed from a fall. She was careful to sleep on one side of the bed, she said, because she wanted to leave a place for her husband. 
time does not soften my grief, nor can I ever be reconciled to my loss until the grave closes over the remembrance and I'm again reunited with him. At 8.15 on the night of July 15, 1882, Mary Todd Lincoln died. After 17 years of waiting, she could at last rest in peace alongside her sons and her husband. In the years that followed, Mary Lincoln was largely forgotten. Abraham Lincoln, the frontier farmer's son, the prairie lawyer, the shrewd politician and stern commander in chief, became America's secular saint. His home in Springfield became something like a shrine. And it became hard to believe that a real flesh and blood couple once lived here, raised their sons, quarreled, mourned and loved one another. 